I'm Melanie Parker, Google's Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you for joining us for Equity Talks, part of our equity learner journey to more deeply examine and understand social injustice through dialogue. Hello, my name is Kamal Bob. I am the Global Lead for Diversity Strategy and Research at Google. Thank you for joining us for our search for racial equity. Today, I have the distinct honor and privilege of having a discussion with Dr. Andrew Jolivet. He is a professor and chair of ethnic studies at the University of California at San Diego and is the founding director of the Native American and Indigenous Studies program also at UCSD. He's the author of Indian Blood, HIV and Colonial Trauma in San Francisco's Two-Spirit Community. He's one of the leading advocates for ethnic studies in American higher education. Dr. Jolivet, Professor Jolivet, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like uh, at the beginning to have you introduce yourself uh, in the following way. Uh, Representative John Lewis, as you know, has just passed recently. It turns out that I'm in his district, the fifth district in Georgia. And uh, it's a mournful period to, to be clear, but he also has left us with the idea of good trouble and the beloved community. And one of your precepts is radical love. If you could introduce yourself a bit through the idea of being a member of a beloved community and what it means to have radical love in that. Sure, thank you. Hiweo, um, again, we hope you We are all relatives and related. And I think that idea actually speaks to what it means to be a part of a beloved community, um, that we're all connected. We're, we're Ken, we're family in different ways. Uh, I came at sort of these questions of uh, racial equity, really from an early age. Uh, my father and mother both were born in the South. Uh, my mother in Alabama, my father in Louisiana. I come from the Atakapa Ishak Nation, from the TCK Opelousa clan, uh, and also from an African-American, uh, West African primarily background, as well as um, you know French and Spanish. And for me, the, that quote that you, you talked about from uh, Congressman Lewis, really speaks to a history of strength, uh, endurance, what I like to talk about is thrivance. How um, are the struggles of my ancestors? So when I introduce myself in the way, I also should say I'm, I'm speaking today from San Diego, California, and in the, in the way in which I was raised, it's important to recognize the land that we're on. And so I wanna recognize uh, the Kumeyaay Nation uh, and people whose land I'm standing on currently um, as well as the Yalamu people where I was born and raised in San Francisco, or excuse me, the uh, Yalamu territory, uh, the Ohlone people uh, of San Francisco. Uh, and so for me, when I recognize, when I introduce myself in that way, to talk about my clan, where I come from, uh, my community, um, to find one's beloved community is to find one's, uh, one's place, one's, uh, one's role and what that role comes responsibility. And so I, I, I really appreciate that question because I think that um, sometimes we don't even have that opportunity. Many of us are struggling to find out what community we really feel a part of because we feel left out. Well, I think uh, I appreciate that introduction. And also I think it matters that you are an, uh, a native person. And there, I think one of the challenges that we often have to contend with in the United States is the history of Native people here, of Indigenous Americans. And so if you would, uh, one of the challenges that we're facing now, uh, obviously in the, in the flux of the moment with this uprising and so on, is the idea of what the history of the country really means to the respective people who are currently here. And I'm not looking for an entire history lesson, but I would like you to, to, help, to help us understand from your particular point of view what some of this history means. Uh, for example, the, the Thanksgiving narrative is one that all Americans and all American school children and so on uh, celebrate. We understand that the Mayflower is central to that idea and that there were pilgrims and so on. 
but we often don't learn about the Trail of Tears and Andrew Jackson's role in Indian removal and so on. So I wonder if you would uh, begin explaining to us just a bit about your personal uh, interaction with that history. Uh, sure. I, I think the first thing that really comes to mind that I actually want to highlight for viewers, particularly because it's so current, um, and it it demonstrates really the uh, history uh, of erasure, uh, invisibility, and misunderstanding. And that's the mascot controversy, actually, that it actually is deeply embedded in history. We would hear, you know, people that would say that this is a tradition or we're trying to honor Native people. Uh, but most people don't know that the term red skin actually refers to bounty hunters who would um, murder, right? They were paid $6, $5, $3 respectively for the bloody red skins of native men, women, and children. And so that, that, that there is this history or that when we think about old, you know, black and white Westerns and we think about scalping that people still continue to think that's not, that's, that actually was the French who were scalping came into play. Um, but even today when we see, um, issues like Mount Rushmore, which are a sacred site to native people that there, as you mentioned, um, removal, for example, that there are a series of events, including Thanksgiving, which were all violent acts. It wasn't about settlement. So when every time I kind of cringe, I watch the news and I hear people saying someone goes off the reservation or um, people are going tribal, right? That it harkens to native people always that we're always stuck and fixed in an imagined past that we're not current and contemporary people. And I think that that, you know, even Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, who helped to found the Boys and Girls, or the Boy Scouts, part of it was this imagined idea of what it meant to be an Indian. So I think these are really sort of all steeped in, as you say, to history. But Thanksgiving, right, this is an, um, this idea that, you know, pilgrims and natives gathered when this was actually a massacre or, or you know, Native people actually were very welcoming. There were new, these newcomers coming uh, who were unknown, unfamiliar, and did teach them farming, prepared meals to gather, and ended up being slaughtered, right? So there's this long history of taking land from Native people. And even as I watched uh, Fourth of July celebrations at Mount Rushmore, there was a huge, the media covered it to some extent, but not that much, right? that native people, the Lakota people actually stood there uh, in protest to block people from entering that space um, were violently attacked. And so we have this long history of that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, um, one of the key things I would say in history that was central to uh, the dispossession of, of native people in terms of land, the genocide uh, of native people was Thomas Jefferson's idea of agrarianism, farming, individualism, that Native people were savage, right? Too too wild and needed to be um, sort of tamed. And so one of the things that's talked about often is that in U.S. Native relations is that how do we solve the Indian problem? And the biggest problem, they said, was how do you get the land? How do you control the people culturally? So shift, right? Cut their hair. And so we have key moments in, in, in history in terms of our relations with uh, with white people and with this colonial government that I would say is still a colonial government. Um, we are not, um, like when we think about occupied territories, the United States is an occupied territory. Um, Native people did not willfully give this land. And so some people like to say, well, it's the spoils of war you lost. Okay, that's a convenient truth, right? When we talk about these different kinds of notions of American exceptionalism, even for example, right? Which also was talked about in these early sort of like enlightenment period, all this was tied together. But when you don't have to put in the same work as someone else and you're just taking, then I don't see how that, that makes you exceptional, right? It makes you a terrorist is what it makes you. And so I think that's what history, if we think about what that history looks like, you first have what we would call a um, contact period, right? We're actually native people and Europeans. There are some sort of um, shared economic sort of interest that's happening, but then you move to a conflict period where you have the Indian, French wars, all these different wars, and then you have removal, right? Where you move people off of their lands, you create uh, what we they called allotment, right? An allotment process, um, the Dawes Act of 1887, which basically said, uh, who was and who was an Indian. 
So we created tribal roles where some people got to be Indian, some people didn't. If you didn't remove and go to Oklahoma or other territories um, west of the Mississippi, um, you weren't Indian anymore, right? And so I think that's also why we have so many struggles, you know, particularly for tribes from the Southeast. I think it's a different story. I think the thing I would also say is that there's a great diversity. There's well over 500 tribes just in the United States. And oftentimes I think most Americans don't even know what the tribes are in the state where they live. Um, and so I think that is also a problem of history. I will say this, any U.S. history course or any course on history period, I think, in this country needs to begin with Native people. And if it doesn't, then there's a problem. Then you don't know the history of the country. That point is really important. What I uh, really appreciate about that is it's, it's related to another theme that you have about erasure and invisibility. And in that, I would like uh, I'd like for you to discuss just a bit. Uh, there's a component of what you were just alluding to with the removal uh, in the 1830s. Uh, and again, I'm not looking for us to make this a history lesson, but I'm fascinated by the way that you presented this. So in the 1830s with the, with the Indian Removal Act, uh, that was clearing out Native peoples from the southeastern sections of the United States, ostensibly to give land to white people for the production of slavery. And so there was a transference of people. Uh, for labor to take place. And given that we're in a moment now where intersectional identities are something that we have to understand the complexity of, the origins of justice and the lack thereof for people of color in the United States, do you think it is um, part of the challenges that we have is that this history that you and your work have tried to explore is so misunderstood? Or is it just that it's not provided that American students and schools and higher ed, higher ed institutions just aren't offered that kind of information? I think it's two things. I think on the one hand, there's a lot of interest in all things Native. And I think that's why I said I brought up Roosevelt, for example, which few people know, um, you know, helped to start the Boy Scouts because he said, there's nothing left to conquer. Manifest destiny is ended you know, we don't have anyone to fight with anymore. He said, quote, boys don't know how to be men anymore. Uh, they knew that when we were fighting the Indians. Uh, there's a great book called Going Native by Sherry Hundorf, where she talks about these ideas of, on the one hand, there's the noble savage, the wise native person, right? Um, or the noble, right? And then there's the other is just the savage. Um, and so I think part of what, what happens is that People don't know, yes, because there's not that history, but also we don't want to remember. I, I can remember uh, during the Olympics, I believe this was the, maybe the 92 games in Utah. Uh, Mitt Romney, I know, was in charge of those. Um, and they had this scene where people were like, oh, great, they have their representing Native people. So they have like the Native people that come out um, that perform and dance. And then right after that, these covered wagons just kind of move them along, right? Um, without any sort of discussion. And so I think so much people have um, in this country have such a lack of knowledge of Native people that it's all reduced to the past um, rather than the present. And I think that's intentional because if we create a narrative that actually tells the truth about the history of the country, then it really makes it more difficult to make the kind of charges we do about other countries, um, even our involvement, say, in fighting against, you know, Nazi Germany, for example, um, and Hitler and his violence, right? If we can't even recognize the history of this country being parallel, right? And really very much connected to um, that type of violence and genocide. And so there's a lot of um, erasure that happens. I talk about it often in my work as a, a paper genocide or a bloodless genocide that also takes place where many native people were, like I said, in 1887, you know, some, you know, 40 years after removal are, um, you know, they have the Dawes Enrollment Act where we say, okay, well, people are going to be able to, we're going to hold land in trust for Native people, but it, it, it's like Native people, be, we became, you know, wards of the state, children, why that land had to be held in trust, but it never was given, right? But also taking communal land holdings, parceling it out, um, much of this was unseated, um, some of this was done through treaty, um, 
but many of those treaties were never honored, right? In fact, even Mount Rushmore, which I mentioned earlier, um, the, the treaties there actually, they still haven't been honored. And actually the Supreme Court actually has said that the black, those hills should be returned um, to you know the Lakota people. Um, and so they gave them a settlement instead and tried to offer them money. I think I recently heard that's just sitting in an accountant and is now worth maybe a billion dollars, but the tribe has refused because you can't buy, right, uh, that which is considered sacred. There's an element of what you suggested there uh, that I would like to pursue. So if we take this now to contemporary times, as you, as you aptly pointed out, the, the Washington Redskins have decided to remove uh, their, to change the name of their symbol and team name and mascot, et cetera. The offense of that seems like we knew that for generations. But if we bring it to, to today's times and the erasure of that history has been significant. So what we're looking for is a search for racial equity. And let me make it personal. So I'm, you know, you and I are contemporaries. I grew up in New York. Uh, I've heard obviously the stories loosely interpreted in my public school history about Native Americans. I didn't really know much about any of it, uh, to be honest. But I went recently to the Chinle uh, reservation in um, northern Arizona, the, the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that I had ever been where I where I knew that the people that I was conversing with were Native people, and I had never been in a space as open and, to be honest, as degraded as there was. Beautiful, albeit just by the nature of it, but the services, the infrastructure, the life, the quality of life, the nature of education, the substance of education, all of it was dilapidated as best at best and what struck me about it is that i just didn't know but now here we are in a moment where there's this idea of bipoc black indigenous and people of color everybody wants to give us some nomenclature so that we can all be put together in various categories but i don't know that there's a particular connection between black people and indigenous people in the way that these uh, titles are being put upon us so I wonder if you would respond for me uh, about how how we do have uh, genuine connectivity when what we actually know about our connectivity is so limited. I think part of that that lack of seemingly like knowledge of that connectivity is is what we see in the media and public, right? When we think about the everyday spaces, though, that there's been this long history of connection. Whether we're talking about how AIM, the American Indian Movement, you know, um, partnered or worked with um, those involved in the civil rights movement or the Black Panthers. Uh, when we think about the history of a place like uh, Louisiana or New Orleans, where my family is from, that there were right there in Congo Square, New Orleans gatherings where Black and Indigenous people and some white, I will say, um, you know, gathered to protest, right? Um, uh, these abuses and, and mistreatments. I think the other thing, though, is that today I actually, you know, it's funny, BIPOC has been a recent term I've been hearing, and I, I can say that I'm not sure I'm a fan. I don't know that I get it. I think I, often, it. I think it's more for people who aren't black and indigenous than it is for black and indigenous people. Um, I think it's this way for people in the same way that we talk about sort of like white guilt and white privilege. And so trying to center uh other communities it almost becomes a way for other people of color who aren't black or indigenous to say well we want to make sure we're censoring you but it, it it feels weird it feels odd to me in some way of um managing us right um paternalizing or infantilizing um black and indigenous people i think what is shared in that history um is that there are convergences whether that we're talking about um, there's so many tribes. So some of the largest tribes, I'll even say, right, the Lumbee Indians um, in North Carolina are a tribe primarily mixed with of Black, Indigenous, and European roots. The Pequot up in Connecticut, one of the largest gaming tribes, um, is mixed race. You asked about Thanksgiving. The tribes up in Massachusetts, Wampanoag, the Mashapee, who um, uh, have, we've tried to strip their tribal recognition, are Black, Indigenous communities. And so Puerto Ricans, if we want to get into that, Tainos, Boricuas, they are Black Indigenous people. Louisiana Creoles are Black Indigenous people. Um, there are these many histories um, 
of racial or interracial mixing between the groups, but also I would say shared struggle and fight. There are also tensions, I think, historically, whether that be Buffalo soldiers who were targeted and used to um, hunt uh, native people, uh, or whether, you know, that was uh, some of the tribes in the Southeast who enslaved African people, right? So there are those tensions that exist, but when we think about it in a contemporary context, what I've seen happen, uh, particularly during the time of COVID, is that Black and Indigenous people are actually coming together in many ways. I've seen many talks talking about either the shared struggle of Black Indigenous peoples, that you can't achieve um, Black liberation without uh, Indigenous self-determination, that those things are intricately linked. Um, but what I'm also seeing is more com increased conversation about the fact that these aren't just two different groups. There are also people who are Black and Indian. We've hidden that, right? There's a great book by Jack Forbes that talks about red black peoples. He talks about it all across the Americas, not just the United States, but if you look at the Caribbean, if you look at Latin America, all along the Atlantic coast, you're talking about black indigenous peoples. Yet we have a census that treats, quote, Hispanic, right? As this sort of uh, term that can erase being Indian and being black. And so that is intentional, right? That is how we control um, people's ideology so that even as we move to a multiracial um, or people of color majority in the United States, um, the hope is that, right, like South Africa or Brazil, where you have minority white populations that will rule um, a majority of people of color nation, right? And you do that through ide ideology or what we talk about is hegemony, right? People give their consent um, because they agree with it, right? That's why you have um, Candace Owens and people like that kind of running around <laughs> and, um, you know, because it becomes profitable, right? Sure. <laughs> Dave Chappelle had some things to say about Candace Owens. I'm sure. <laughs> you, uh, you just raised a relationship that I hadn't thought of before, nor have I heard about, that Black liberation and Native self-determination are correlated. If you could explain what that interdependence is, I, I find it intriguing. Sure. I think that the, the, the first part is if we are going to coexist and we live here, right, and if we take the idea that I was talked about a little bit earlier about kinship and about relationships, or even when I greeted and welcomed and said, we hope we are all relatives, uh, we are all interconnected, that it is my responsibility, both as an indigenous person, to ensure that if we want justice in this search for racial equity, then we have to have black liberation, right? Um, because they're mutually dependent on one another, right? In this, and, and in the same way, if native people don't have self-determination, if black people are not working as a black person, if I'm not striving for that, then I will never achieve um, freedom, true freedom. Um, and I think part of that reason that they are mutually based on each other, Ruthie Gilmore, she talks about this in terms of prisons. And she says that we have to abolish, we can't undo prisons without undoing capitalism because they are the two feet off of each other. And so the whole history of this country is really based on the subjugation, right, of black people and the uh, dispossession of native people and their lands, right? And so these things, um, are mutually um, constitutive, right? They, they, they help to form each other. And so it's kind of like in the same way when people, I think of it like gay marriage. When people said, and that may seem like, wait, why is he saying gay marriage? What does that have to do with any of this? When people would say, oh, now we're equal, right? And that's why this series is so important because we're talking about differences between equality and equity. They're not the same thing, right? Giving people the same thing when one set of people have been given something different for so long will not allow us to achieve equity, right? We, you know, I think we, we know that. Um, and so when I think we, about gay marriage, it's aspirational to accomplish something that mainstream society has created and said in a legal sense, you can't have access to. So once you have access to that, does that now mean that you're free? Or what about other aspect, other people in society who still can't get married, whether it's because of their immigration status or something else, right? And so that's what I mean that these things are, um, they're interconnected. And so until we actually, because because then it's only partial, right? If we only address, say for example, uh, the issue of black freedom and what it requires to 
accomplish black freedom. And I think that's why a lot of people actually who've been talking about reparations have been talking about black and indigenous rep reparations, right? And including those things together. I think more Americans, at least in my experience, are seeing the connection between uh, these two communities uh, because we know that the history of this country's ability to quote unquote become exceptional has been based on not just what they what was done to native people, but also what was done to black people. And so if we don't address both, we will never get to, we won't get to equity, right? Because unless we're all free as the old saying goes, then none of us are free. I think that's really true um, because then they can, then whatever is happening to that group that's still not free, right? Or that still doesn't have that self-determination. Well, who's to say that that then won't happen to other groups? And I will add, I think that's part of what we're seeing in terms of contemporary backlash against Black Lives Matter or I don't know more movements is uh, people are afraid uh, that black and indigenous people and other people of color are going to do these sort of horrific things to white people that they've done. That, that is a true fear, I think. And many people have said that that is that's not what, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for um, justice, right? Um, so I think that's really important. Well, I, I agree, and I also think that there's really no evidence to suggest that our struggles for justice and freedom have been laced with vengeance. They've always been laced with a connectivity. The whole idea that we would have a, a concept of beloved community when we are, in fact, a beleaguered community, I think, mm -hmm. indicates what we're about. But that said, let's let's do this. If you take what you were just suggesting about the interconnectedness and the interconnected nature of the, the Black and Indigenous community and communities of color more broadly, but particularly those two, in the United States context, there is a counter argument. I think that the, the resistance that we're facing is rooted in an argument that America however uh, weak the merit of the argument might be, but that America will be fine without the acknowledging the contributions, the presence, the meaning, the value proposition of our, our respective communities. I think we're seeing evidence of that here. I think that's what some of this resistance as you alluded to is about. And we can also make that to the universities uh, that we're in. I think there's a, there's a parallel example there. And now I'm transitioning a bit into some of your current work. Uh, the diversity argument, uh, the search for racial equity is an umbrella, but the diversity argument, if it's framed as a representational one, suggests that you have to have the diversity of racial and ethnic groups in order to be more innovative, in order to be more complete, whole, creative, etc. But in institutions like University of California at San Diego, University of California at Berkeley, where I'm, uh, where I graduated from, they don't have the diversity of Black and, and Native American people at all. They've never had it. And so their success, albeit what they trumpet, is that they need it and want it, they don't have to have it. So one, it, it, it begs the question of what success means, but it also begs the question of the reality of what we're contending with. So in the, in the country's narrative that you just laid out, how do you counter that argument where the proportions of Native Americans, for example, in all of these companies, institutions, schools, uh, presence in people's lives, is so underdetermined and uh, limited that we don't know, but our lives continue apace regardless. So how do you counter that argument uh, so that we can effectively get to the heart of the issue? I think it's a both and sort of question because what immediately came to mind was this idea is, do we need to be in those spaces, right? Um, and I think that we have been excluded from them historically, but also there's this idea that we didn't create these spaces to some extent, but I think we have, right? Um, whether we're talking about black or indigenous peoples, period, like what the history, what the possibilities, just like I was saying previously, without the land, without the labor of black indigenous peoples, these universities that they, that you know, that they're, the land they're occupied, they wouldn't even exist. Right, there are many of them that have been built by enslaved people or even native people too, the quietly as it's kept, or enslaved native people who were sold on Market Street in San Francisco, right? That that history doesn't get talked about. Um, I think what I what first comes to mind though is this idea that um, it's really important for us to also have our own 
Um, we have to reform these institutions. So whether we're talking about higher education institutions, whether we're talking about Google, where we're, whether we're talking about um, Amazon, whatever, any corporation, any institution, whether we're talking about the churches and, and, and whatnot in, in the country, I think they are all impacted by a system of colonization, white supremacy, right? Um, or more so, more importantly, I would actually argue that white supremacy is white hegemony, the idea that certain ideas hold more power and validity than others, right? Uh, and so that's when you have, you know, native students at graduations who are told they can't wear an eagle feather, which is a sign of high honor, right? Or black students who can't wear braids to school that you start now, all of a sudden we're seeing all these changes happening rapidly or even where the UC, right? Just appointed their first black president of the entire UC system, right? Um, and I was interviewed actually by local San Diego press and I was impressed with the reporter because she was like, Okay, let's be real here too, though. This happened, but right yet, yeah, UC San Diego has a 3% black student population. Um, most of the UCs are around the 3 4 range, right? Why do we not represent? And I said, let's do the cautionary tale. I've worked at other institutions where a person of color was hired um, to head a university, and that sometimes is done intentionally. This is why I keep talking about the ideology. And so for me, I think it's really important that we center our own sense of what are our values, right? And that doesn't mean we always, we're just gonna like, oh, magically go back to some pre-colonial moment per se. There are lessons there. And what we talk about in native communities as our original instructions, right? What is the knowledge that's been passed on from generation to generation, but also how do we change as time goes on too? What have we added to those, those kind of instructions? And so for me, I wanna see us radically transform these spaces if we're gonna be in them, right? And so for me, what I would actually argue, and I've talked about this in one of the books, uh, Research Justice, Methodologies for Social Change, um, I talk about um, two terms. One comes from a Cree scholar, Sean Wilson, um, and it's research as ceremony. When we think about research as ceremony, how do we change the way that we conduct research? Do we just go into somebody's community and say, oh, hey, I wanna learn about you, right? I mean talking about this history that you're saying, right? We have the issue of NAGPRA, for example, Native American Grave Repatriation Act, which was passed in the 90s to protect Native people whose human remains and cultural artifacts had been, you know, stolen and that these universities house them. And I've always told people, well, no one thinks that's odd when it happens to Native people or Black people. But if we go dig up Thomas Jefferson and say we're going to study him, right, or George Washington or whoever it might be, people are like, why are you doing that? That's You can't do that. You know, dig up your own grandmother is what I've told people, right? Don't dig up ours. Um, and so for me, though, to radically transform the university requires us to think about the work that we do, whether that's as teachers or as min as administrators, as, as ceremony. And I don't mean that in a religious context. How can we actually shift if I say that or if I say my students, that's that's a kinship relationship, not a, a commodity relationship or a capitalist relationship or a hierarchical relationship even of I'm, you know, I'm your instructor or I'm this administrator. How does that actually fundamentally change the way that these institutions function and where our priorities and values are? Because otherwise we can put all the Indians and black people we want on these campuses, but it, it's not gonna change if the ideas that we center and hold are still the ideas that were used to colonize us in the first place. Um, and so that's what research justice looks like is it's centering our own knowledge at, at the forefront. I heard from some elders many years ago, we don't need more um, Indian experts, we need more expert Indians. And what that meant to me, right, and I'd say the same for black folks, I mean, we know in both native and black communities, uh, we are two of the basically smallest represented populations in higher ed who have, you know, post -grad or graduate or PhDs or even undergraduate, you know, bachelor's degrees. And so that's that's always been a part of that history too, I think. Well, along those lines, you uh, lay out there some arguments that I find profound. So professor, if you would explain a little bit about the nature of these, uh, these elite spaces, uh, for lack of a better word. So as you pointed out, Michael Drake is the new president of the UC system. And the UC system, as you also pointed out, is highly elite. Uh, and there are very, very few Black and Indigenous students at those schools, faculty as well. So when you are doing your work in the UC space, the, the most elite strata of American higher education, 
I find it profound that you you founded a center on Native uh, American studies and indigenous studies there, ethnic studies also. Say a little bit about the importance of that kind of scholarship in the space at which you are doing it. Mm. You know, two things come to mind to be really real and frank with you. I think what I found in my experience, because I was also in the CSU for many years at San Francisco State, um, I think folks don't know how to interpret me <laughs> sometimes uh, being, uh, they want me to come do something because I am uh, queer, LGBT, two-spirit, black, native, mixed person, right? You can, this, I wrote an article recently, this bridge called my multiracial back, right? This idea that you're, that you get like, it's, a, I, you're a twofer, not even a twofer, you're a threefer, right? You get three, four things out of one person. But I think what I've also found, like at the height of the recent protest at UC San Diego was really being tired very quickly and frustrated and talking to other black faculty, the very few that are there um, as well, about this sense of, wait a minute, why am I organizing this town hall to talk about this? Or why do I have to be the person that's, shouldn't someone else be doing this work, but also feeling like I do have that responsibility. And that's what that kinship looks like. That's what that solidarity work looks like. I think for me, I've always tried to push back against these institutions and say, no, you need to listen. You need to hear, you have a responsibility. And part of it is, yeah, use the guilt that these folks do have, I think sometimes is that, you know what, you don't actually understand. It's not even guilt. I think it's honesty and saying, you know what, this is a really, you know, messed up situation that is violent um, and not being afraid to say that in a dean's face or a chancellor's face or whoever it is, it doesn't matter. And so that can be challenging, but I also recognize that I'm already a tenured professor. And we can. So with that sort of privilege on the one hand also comes responsibility. So how do you um, sort of push back. I know UCSD had been trying to get a Native Studies, you know, program for many years, and we just implemented it's just the minor, it's the first stage of this, but people were like, you know, happy that we were able to do that. And I think part of it was that people also just don't understand Native Studies that much on these campuses in the UC. So they may let us go for it and just do things, and they're not going to stop it because they don't really, but they also don't know why it's there, right? So on the one hand, Maybe there's the freedom to create these things if you have the people there to create it. But people also have to understand why it's being created so that it becomes sustainable. Like Dr. Drake coming in, you know, I said, you know, I think that that's great, but he can't do it alone. He does have a great track record. I understand um, at Ohio, you know, you know, creating scholarship programs, doing recruitment of students. Those are all great things. We also have, though, have to have the infrastructure and cultural change so that people feel welcome on those campuses well before, you know, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and others in Indian country, missing murdered indigenous women. Um, long before that, we had the cases of the college students at Yale, you know, sleeping while black or these other incidents where people weren't, you know, were in places where they were considered not to belong. That is about ideology and cultural understanding. And I think that's what we also need to shift at these institutions. So when I show up at, you know, my college or divisional chairs meeting and I'm the only brown face in the whole, you know, group, whether so now, you know, maybe being the only, uh, only black person and the only native person and the only person, maybe I nah, maybe the only person of color, you know, that's a huge responsibility. And that also has to change. So I don't mean to say when I said earlier that, we don't want more numbers of people. Um, I think we just don't want to assume that that alone is enough. That is not sufficient. So there you raise a very important point. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of this dialogue that I would like to get into about the attractiveness of elite institutions for people of color uh, like yourself. And so when you create uh, a center or a program of Native, and, Native American Indigenous Studies at UCSD, as I said, UCSD is one of the most elite public institutions in the country, if not in the world. Mm -hmm. And so access to you is, is also a kind of cherished commodity. I mean, it's only the most elite and prepared and privileged students, to be frank, who ever get access to you directly. And so to that extent, because your own crusade for racial equity, uh, and I don't mean to use the term here glibly, but your own crusade for examining the, the origins of indigenous people, the, the, the kind of convoluted path in the American story, you essentially are a gift 
to your students and to scholarship more broadly, but you're not that accessible. And so in that sense, where do you think is our best uh, mechanism for expanding people's understanding of the kinds of information that you have to offer? Mm -hmm. I think the best way, and I'll speak for myself, right, is that actually what I try to do is be very accessible to the point where sometimes people, including my dad, who's like, stop saying yes to everything, right? I've been very involved in community organizations my whole life and in activist organizations and to try to make things accessible. Anybody who messages me, I try to write back. I know that that's, it's rare for, I think, academics to do that. It weighs, right, when there are so few folks of color and then there's these other categories that I talked about um, that we might occupy, like being LGBT category, that you have even more people coming. And so you're right. I think part of the, the accessibility is not just to write books about this or write journal articles about this, but is to show up um, for community based groups and organizations. So I work um, and am the board chair of the American Indian Cultural Center in San Francisco, even after I moved. Uh, from San Francisco and moved here, I continue to work with that organization to make sure that we're providing resources or whether it's creating like when COVID hit, um, working with, even though it was other academics, but to provide on the ground resources for tribes who were suffering. And so we created, I created a resource group or page, mind you, it was on Facebook, right? Because we do know that as you brought up earlier, when you visited Chin Lee, you know, access and, and information um, and so this is where sort of this new concept I've been talking about, thriving circuitry is really important because when we create circuits or routes or connections, right, to one another, we can spread um, resources, right? And so each time I feel like I speak or touch or have some impact on a student, whether that was at San Francisco State or whether it was some of the community colleges um, that maybe I've taught at or whether it's here at UC San Diego or lectured, you know, in different places, that that person then goes and brings that back out into the community. And I think that is also what it means to be, as you started out so eloquently and importantly, uh, to be a part of a beloved community. That's what kinship looks like on the ground is that those circuits allow each of us to thrive, to contribute something in that circle um, that produces more equality, right? And so um, these are kind of some of the ways that I feel like that I've tried to, to, to do that myself and why I'm even in education, I think. Um, I used to be a K to 12, I was in education in K to 12, I was a dean. These were actually very affluent kind of schools, um, very privileged, very white spaces. Um, folks like the kids who run, the folks who run the Gap, their kids went there, right? Um, the folks who run the Gap. Yes, their kids. <laughs> <went to> this <laughs> I just shot I'll give you an idea. I won't mention <laughs> all, all the different uh, places. Um, uh, the uh, governor of Illinois, uh, Pitzer, Fitzer, his um, nephew was at one of these schools. So these kind of folks, Robin Williams, all these people. But we always would ask, like some of the folks of color who worked at these schools, and I didn't stay in them very long. But why would we want to work in these spaces that are so? So I think about this when I think about UC and your question. Why, work, why would folks of color want to be in these spaces that are so privileged or elite? Or I think about even um, Joy Reid, who just got a new show on MSNBC. I'm kind of a news junkie. And some of the things Joe Biden said to her yesterday, comments about, oh, finally about time. Oh, first, you know, black woman in prime time, this news hour to lead this show. And why would someone like, you know, Joy or any of us want to be in these spaces that are considered elite? Why wouldn't we be, right? Because they're not elite because there's white people there that, you know, it's, I think they're elite because of what we provided in terms of resource to be created in the first place. Right. But also how do we shift them? So that elite doesn't mean disproportionate, unequal, racist. Right. And so I think we have a responsibility to shift what quote unquote elite institutions look like. And I don't even think we want them to be called elite anymore. We want them to be equitable, socially transformative, radical institutions. And I don't think that that should be a bad thing um, when we think about, you know, these different ideologies that get circulated. If you could, I, I really appreciate that. So the idea of what elite means, I think that it's it's profoundly interconnected with race. Mm -hmm. So the, the the American concept of, of elite institutions, certainly it's correlated with having disproportionately high numbers of white people Asian people and the like, especially in the tech space. Uh, but that 
there's an there's an alternative narrative, uh, as you alluded to earlier. So just sticking to the higher ed uh, idea, the historically black colleges and universities, and the tribal colleges and, and universities as well. There isn't a, a broad American concept of elite institutions coming out of those spaces. Among our respective communities, of course, there are. They're highly significant. They're irreplaceable to our history and what our ability to be able to con confront the nature of the country has been. But do you think that there is a path where white people will think that black and brown institutions are elite and will be, for example, in the instance of those uh, recent scandals where people are cheating and lying and devaluing and doing all these things to get into places like UCLA and USD, like what would be the version of an America where those same uh, rich white families would be lying and cheating and stealing to get into Howard University or to get into University of Texas at El Paso and so on? How, how would that construct shift? It's interesting you asked this because I was actually going to bring up the HBCUs a bit. I went to one briefly. Um, <clears throat> I went to Lincoln University in um, Pennsylvania. And um, I actually looked at tribal colleges. Many of the 30 some odd, 36 or so tribal colleges um, are two year colleges. And so I kind of backed away from that. And this was for undergrad. And then um, at the last minute said, oh, I'm going to go. To I chose not to go to a UC, for example, or to go to LSU or my family wanted me to go. And I went to Lincoln um, and it was a good experience. It was in a lot of ways. I think though what you speak to um, was interesting. There were actually a lot of white people there. Um, I went to this place and expected black professors and teachers. I think out of the four or five classes I had, two or three of the teachers were white. I was surprised by that, right? Um, so I think what's interesting is that I don't know if there's there necessarily is an equivalent uh, of that or and if there should be one. I think that part of what you're asking is is a is a broader, bigger question about do do are white people capable of recognizing black and, and indigenous excellence wherever it exists, that there are black doctors or lawyers or teachers or whatever they do, right? And that's the other thing, right? When we think of elite, this is again, why we have to shift ideologies. You know, what kind of careers or what kind of work do we value and see as meaningful or important? How do people's reactions change to me when I go to the 7-Eleven right here in my neighborhood, maybe to grab a coffee or something, and they see me regularly and ask me because it's COVID, oh, are you working from home and blah, blah. And then I tell them what I do. I can tell you how many times when I tell someone what I've done, and I've been doing it when I was very young, right? I've been doing this since 20s. I was like 25 when I taught my first college class, I think. And so particularly being young, black, native, you know, of color, the way people read that. And so as soon as like people are shocked, right? You're, you know, that's what you do, right? And so I think part of it is not so much that we need to recognize the institutions themselves as being, because I don't think we would want to do that. That would just be replacing and saying, oh, you know, how, right, which Howard has this reputation, right? Or some of the schools, right, I think in the historically black colleges do have a little bit more of a different reputation than others as being more elite or more select than the others, right? Um, but I don't think we want to re replicate that, right? That we don't want to recreate these same patterns, right? We want to dismantle them and shift them uh, so that they are transformative. They are, they are spaces of healing. Um, I think that's what's really important. I think that I, while I agree that there's a, there's a component of that uh, where we don't necessarily want to replicate the same kind of system because it, it, it has a lot of negative unintended consequences. But as you rightly point out, there is the bigger question about the recognition of what it means to be excellent and to be of color. And we certainly, because you, for example, you personify excellence and being intersectional in your own identity. So I look at you, you appear to be a black man to me. I already know that you're excellent in what you do and I'm comfortable with that. And I could sit in your class and defer to your knowledge and be comfortable with that too. But I don't think that that's universally experienced. Just as you said, when people are, they're surprised by what, you, what you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So in that, let's turn a corner to what cultural revitalization means. Because to me, 
ultimately our inability across the American spectrum to recognize that kind of excellence, it's a cultural attribute. And so there we need to be able to figure out how to reconstitute what our culture actually is. And by this hour, I mean the, the broader hour, the, the American hour. Uh, so you have done a lot in what cultural revitalization means and some of the mechanisms for achieving that. So perhaps if you could kind of steer us towards the hopeful end uh, of this dialogue and, and, and respond to that. Sure. I think if I want to connect cultural revitalization to another concept that I talked about in some of my work, um, radical love. Radical love is this idea that, at least the way I define it, other people have talked about radical love. A colleague of mine talks about Sean Jenright, radical hope. Um, and I think... I think that it's really important for me us to address vulnerabilities. So for me, even sharing or talking about my own experience and how I'm perceived in terms of as a black male, I would say too, um, and whether that's perceived university or not as excellent is how am I pushing back against that culture? But also when I was talking earlier about these spaces and these institutions that we're in, how do we challenge what our notions are of even what it means to be an Indian person. So for example, that's also when I think about when I walk into a space and say, well, you're not asking the person over there with the blonde hair and blue eyes if they're Indian or not, but you're asking me. Um, I think that's an interesting thing that we have to deal with. Um, so part of the, the, the thing is being vulnerable and until we can actually be vulnerable with one, in, one another, we can't really heal and address the disparities that you know, or inequalities that exist in this country. Um, and th so I think that's the first step. I would say these have to happen in stages. So the first part is dealing with, you know, sort of recognizing and getting to a place where we can enact radical love, where we can be vulnerable with one another, tell our stories, tell our history. Some people talk about this as truth and reconciliation in other countries. Um, and so, uh, but I think that's the, can't be the end point. So then from there, I think then it's the work of cultural revitalization and cultural transformation, I would add, is how do we shift the, um, how do we all, how do we maintain our culture, right? When we have had languages stripped from us, when we've had our own knowledge systems stripped from us, but we also have to think about what are all the, what are all the forms and examples of black excellence that do exist or native excellence that do exist that are contemporary, right? And so I think writing those, documenting those, always reminding people of the fact that they exist, that is each of us playing a role in shifting that culture of this country. And really, you know, hopefully someday getting to a point where it doesn't have to even be a question that um, black and indigenous excellence exists all across every segment of this society. And so part of that is first stopping and shifting our culture and, and coming back to this idea again that I've talked about a lot today, and that is the idea of kinship. Um, and relationality. So if we all stopped, all of us, and when I say our or all of us, I mean everyone in this country, and really thought of one another and said, no, I'm not sure, I don't need you to be my ally because an ally, that means it's transactional, right? That I'm gonna do something for you so you'll later do something for me. That's what the implication is. Um, then others are saying, well, you're my accomplice in this struggle. I don't need you to be my accomplice either because it sounds like, let's use our own words. Let's not, you know, and so for me, it is about this notion of relationality, relationships, kinship, ceremony. And when we think about, I'm connected to, like we've never met before. After today, the things you've asked me, the things you've said to me, I can never undo the connection that we may have made, whether or not I ever speak to you or see you again in life, right? there is a connection there and your spirit has enacted upon my spirit and will shift and change in some way, maybe how I think about something or how I might, you know, think about these questions. And hopefully the same is true of you. I think when we do that in a much, even in a very intentional way and in a, on an everyday basis, right. Um, that that can be very, that that is, that is transformative. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is maybe, and maybe it sounds hopeful. Maybe it sounds too, um, quote unquote easy, but I think it's actually one of the, it's the hardest thing one can do, right? Do we really go outside and look at someone that we've never met before and think of that person, look in their eyes and say, that's my brother or that's my sister. I'll share a story with you to tell you a little bit what I'm getting at here. 
when I was 27, I was trying to finish up my dissertation. I was lecturing at San Francisco State. Um, I was a dean. I had like all these jobs. And I think this is why I probably got sick. Um, I didn't really see the connection between the various parts of my identity and the different struggles that I was facing. I was like, I'm a black man. I'm an Indian person. You know, I'm more comfortable in identifying with my native heritage as an Ishak person. Um, that's my focus. Like the queer community is white, is racist as hell. I'd rather, you know, kind of focus on dealing with race issues. Um, when I was 27, I got diagnosed with AIDS uh, unexpectedly. Uh, I had 35 T cells. Um, so once you have less than 200 T cells, it's an AIDS diagnosis. My viral load, which is what measures how much, you know, um, of the viruses in your system was 500,000 copies. So I was sick. I was pretty close to dying. In fact, I had uh, pneumocystis, a form of pneumonia. That was the number one killer of people with HIV and AIDS. Um, and thankfully, the drug I used, which actually I turned out to be allergic to, saved my life. I share that to say that shortly after I got out of the hospital, 25 pounds lighter, um, wondering if I was, you know, going to make it, if I would ever finish my PhD, if I would ever get a job as, you know, a full-time job as a professor, just not even that, really. I mean, my first thoughts were my siblings and my parents and what I see my nieces and nephews grow up, really, you know, those were my thoughts. Um, and would I ever see my students, you know, again, that I was working with at that middle school, those were my thoughts. So I had a, um, we had a, uh, some friends organized a, a, what's called a pipe ceremony. Um, some people also have told me, oh, it's a peyote. Well, I'm like, I, it's a pipe ceremony. A friend recently said, oh, that's a, that was that was, that's, that was a peyote ceremony. You could say peyote. I was like, no, it's not that. It's not the problem. Um, but the point is that 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 ceremony was organized by a friend, a uh, longtime friend who is a medicine person from the Dene Navajo Nation. Um, and Dan, Dan Freeland was uh, his name. He's, he's gone on to the spirit world now. But during the ceremony, Dan told me, he said, Andrew, he said, there's a lot of people out there going through exactly what you're going through. Um, your brothers, your sisters. He said, I'd, number one, I don't want you to think of yourself as sick. And number two, I want you to think of your, your, these, your relatives. And he didn't mean that in terms of blood. Think of them as your medicine, right? That your community is your medicine. And so I think what I wanna share in saying all of this is that when we look outside of ourselves um, and just what we're facing, and we think about our community as our medicine, how does that allow us to heal and address these things? Because in a Western, this is what I've been saying today too, is you know these ideologies shifting, rather than looking for just a cure from COVID, how are we gonna heal from COVID? That's different. We might find a vaccine and what has happened as a result of the experiences and the wrath that it has brought upon black and indigenous peoples, this violence that the slave ships brought, that the smallpox blankets brought, still exists in 2020, right? In the form of COVID and the term, uh, terms of, you know, the violence um, that's still taking place in our communities at disproportionate levels. And so if we do shift, right, the, how do you, I've always thought about it, like I talk a lot about soul wound or um, intergenerational trauma in my work. And I've always kind of thought about, there's the film Crash. I'm sure many of the folks watching today have maybe seen the old film Crash. It was kind of people said, oh, it's this great film, on mainstream Hollywood film on race and whatnot. Many of us um, who kind of do this work were like, yeah, it's okay. Um, I think the point though, I wrote an article about it talking about um, indigenous people being invisible from crash um, and why that was, but also talking about the fact that the greatest soul wound that actually exists, I thought was in white communities. As someone who actually does have European ancestry or white ancestry, um, I've always thought, and I talked about this in my book on Louisiana Creoles in the first chapter, I said, who is white? Let's flip the narrative, right? Who always asking who's black, who's Indian, who's legit, who's real? What does it mean to be white? And so I think that's something else I would offer for folks to think about today, too, is if we really want to do cultural revitalization work, that doesn't just mean black and indigenous people. White people need to go do cultural revitalization work, find out who they are, stop appropriating black and indigenous culture, right, and music and cultural forms, um, you know, and really understand themselves and, and, and get to know and think about what medicine do you have to offer and how are we going to offer that medicine to one another in the form of, you know, really 
um, caring, not the, not just in a moment, right? And as I've told people, I wrote in this article on um, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation website about black and indigenous people and, and, and pride celebrations. It's not just about, you know, throwing up a Black Lives Matter, you know, black symbol in a Instagram post or the huge amounts, which is great, right? And Rep. Lewis, uh, Representative Congressman Lewis, who also, you know, um, talked about the shift and the difference between, you know, the civil rights movement or SNCC and Southern Christian leadership. And I'd even add like American Indian movement to that or Brown Berets or other orgs that it's so much more multiracial today. I would almost also say though, just watching and witnessing the little bit, you know, in real time, both on television, but also in San Diego is that's a whole lot of white folks, right? So there's also ways in which these movements are getting commodified and co-opted where it's a trendy thing to say black lives matter or native lives matter. And I think that's that other intersection that our communities have in common is where cultures have been appropriated. And so I, I think that that for me is let's stop doing that, right? <laughs> let's stop doing that. That's another step in this process of the revitalization. And let's start thinking about how we become medicine to one another. Professor Andrew Jolivet, your own journey is clearly one that's a search for racial equity. I really appreciate the, the medicinal uh, layer of hope that you've concluded with there. Thank you so much for joining us with this conversation. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Be well. You too. Learn about Google's Equity Learner Journey on diversity.google.com and sign up to learn about new episodes.